Hello, everybody. <clears throat> so, do we have any initial any questions? Were the were the um, course pages clear? I assume not, you don't say anything. I assume it's okay. We even have everybody here. That's pretty good. Um, so if there are no questions, I'll just continue with some uh, going through some of the lectures. Is that okay? Or do you, would you like to do something else? I mean, ask questions of some sort. There's not much I can do unless you tell me what you want me to. I mean, I have these uh, lectures which I can go through, which actually I was going through yes, last time, but didn't finish. So I'm going to continue that unless you have questions. All right, well, I can, we'll start that. Let me just share my uh, screen. We, I wanted to look at this part here. Can you see my pointer? Damn. I'm not very good at the Zoom uh, interface. There is a picture here in the middle, and it shows a lot of um, lights, things lit up, and that's where particles have hit um, the detector, which I've explained is giant. And um, this visualization is drawn after the event is taken. And the thing that's interesting about this event, all events have lots and lots of activity going up and down this diagonal line here, because that's where the original particles traversed. But then if you have some interesting events, like you produce a Higgs boson, events chuck, rush out to the sides. And uh, so you want to detect those, those things coming out in unusual directions. And you effectively do that by um, this, uh, these things here with dots, this red, this sphere with dots is meant to illustrate that effectively what these experiment measurement measure is the amount of energy going off in different directions. And if you take particular particles produced, here is a quark or a gluon, here is a Higgs or a so-called W or Z boson, here is a exotic quark or the top quark, they all produce somewhat different um, structures of these, of these things um, um, moving off to the side. And this is sort of interesting for deep learning because these are patterns. And so the deep learning application to these events looks at the energy structure put in, uh, projected on a sphere and identifies structure and maps those structure into types of events. All right, so that's the application. <clears throat> and say, so, well, I worked on this in 1978 with uh, somebody you would know far better than me, namely Stephen Wolfram, who founded Mathematica. Um, my research grant at Caltech funded the beginning of Mathematica for the first two years. And Stephen was my student. And <clears throat> So this is it's sort of interesting. We developed a method for doing this, which was incredibly simple. So-called Fox Wolf from moments, which happened to be listed here. And that particular method has, it's actually my most cited paper. It had 65 citations in 2019 and 30 in 2020. It needs almost no computing and it's uh, sort of okay. But recently, a whole group of people, including actually people from my old institution, Caltech, have introduced deep learning methods, which are illustrated on the side here called JediNet. This is not the only people who do this, but you basically take, you take either simulated data or real data, which you label, and you map the energy structures into event types, such as this is a Higgs boson or this is a high transverse momentum quark or something. 
and I haven't studied the um, their new results in detail, but not surprisingly, uh, they will claim to get um, much better answers. So I assume my citations will go down. Um, but it's uh, so. Um, <clears throat> Anyway, I give an archive link here to the paper of JediNet. But if you took JediNet, you'll find it. But um, it's uh, it's again it's a it's effectively looking for patterns in an image. This image happens to be the surface of a sphere, uh, but that's not a that's just a minor technical issue. And you're just mapping patterns into um, into uh, classifications, which is what the most successful deep learning image processing does, it maps polar, pictures of polar bears into polar bears. This is mapping the energy produced by Higgs boson into Higgs bosons or whatever they produce this energy. So, so I point this out, this is an idea where this method we did in 78, which is of course, you could call it machine learning if you like, it sort of certainly does some calculations and calculates some moments and it um, is being replaced by deep learning, which is one of the claims of this course. Well, it is um, something I've probably shown already, which is a totally different type of example. However, when it is, when generalized, it's hugely important. Uh, and it's, uh, this was done with other people at uh, this university. Vikram Jadeo and JCS Kaju Pichua. And the simple, and the idea is just to replace a simulation, which is effectively Schrodinger's equation. Well, it's actually not even Schrodinger, but it's classical mechanics. So it's Newton's laws expressing molecular dynamics. And you, you either run that for a long time on a parallel computer, or you, well, you do that, or you train a neural net to be able to give those results. And uh, here is the neural net, which is a fully connected neural net. Or um, let me just try to get rid of this thing. Or uh, here we have this fully connected network at the top here. Uh, which is a pretty simple network. And here at the um, um, bottom is some typical results which show uh, good agreement between the prediction and the calculation. So, all right. and as I mentioned before, I think General Electric uses this for computational flow dynamics simulations. There is an even more sophisticated um, paper from a year ago, which uh, has this uh, impressive uh, title. It gets a speed up of 2 billion using the neural net to replace the simulation. And it has a much more complicated um, network shown here, which uh, is full of convolutional layers. And um, it's not quite clear to me why this particular network is so good because some of the cases as applies do not have images in them. They have numer just numerical results. Anyway, that's the network and it's a case where the network is actually learned. There's something called neural architecture search where you search for the right network and that was used in this paper. And they have 10, so they don't do one case like we did with uh, in the previous slide. They do 10 totally different cases from seismology to climate. Um, and here are some summary of the results. Here are the, um, uh, I think these are the, uh, this, this is the, these are the ocean and the climate simulations which are images, so maybe it's fine that you have uh, convolutional neural nets. And uh, this is the comparison between the simulation and the results of the neural net simulation here for ocean, results of the neural net for ocean. 
And here is a plot of the speed up. And the speed up is higher for ocean and climate just because those basic simulations take huge, they're very large and take an enormous amount of time. Whereas running something through a neural net is not going to take that long ever. And, um, and this plot here, which we won't want to go through, just explains that the uh, deep learning network, uh, the, the uh, Deep learning network always does better than the uh, <clears throat> than the um, any other machine learning, with some minor issue over here for this particular uh, one simulation. A manually designed neural net does better than their optimized one. Anyway, they're all either near one or much larger than one, showing that um, this method is pretty successful. And here is actually the, uh, these are the 10 um, examples, which vary, you can see the fusion, seismology, ocean, climate, some scattering experiments, and spectroscopy. I'm not quite certain what uh, edge localized modes is. Um, here we have a uh, astrophysics computation halo and um, here is the data set they use for training. And notice they have a very small data set for climate and not so large for ocean. For the others, they have 6,000 or more. And of course, they've reduced the number for climate because cl climate takes a long time to simulate. So they, they didn't want to use a lot of computer time. But normally, you would not expect to be able to um, take a simulation with only 39 in the training set and train a network to learn it. And as far as I know, nobody has ever else has actually done anything quite like this, where you, where effectively the network is learned on a different simulation from the one it's applied to. Um, so I find these results They've already set up a company to exploit this, so um, probably we'll never find out exactly what they did. But redoing this and looking at this in more detail, I think is pretty pretty interesting and important. Uh, here's coming back to work we did with JCS and uh, and Judeo, and this is um, the pre. This is a. a we started, if we looked at the first example, that was a fully connected network. The last one was a, a whole set of convolutional networks. This is a recurrent neural net, and it is predicting uh, the, these simulations you see here. Uh, let me think, which is, it will tell us soon which is which. All right, here's the real simulation, four views of it. Here is the recurrent neural network prediction of it. And the striking thing about the recurrent neural net is actually better than the, it predicts for very long, predicts forward in time very well. Whereas traditional numerical discretization methods, you have to take tiny time steps like here is 0 0.001, whereas this thing works up to a time step of 4,000 times longer, time step of four. And here's the plot of the error for that time step, which is somewhat bigger than the smallest time step, 0.1. But um, if you did molecular dynamics, even at 0.1, it gets an error of 10 to the 23, and then it just explodes. So this I find, uh, I think this is a pretty interesting result that the neural net has not only learned the um, molecular dynamics equations, but actually has given you a way of representing those equations numerically, which has, has significant advantages over the, um, over the original method. But of course, we still need the original method to train this network. So it's not as though it's totally replaced it, but it's possibly gives you a way of um, exploring different things with more reliability. All right. So that was the end of um, my comment, my uh, discussion of examples.
<clears throat> there were just things we were doing and I just wanted to show how deep learning could be applied to all these different cases, earthquake, COVID, COVID, COVID death and uh, fatality and infection, particle physics, energy distributions, and then simulations of a variety of sort. Um, any questions on that? No questions. All right. Let's let's move on <coughs> to the, the next the next few slides. Just go through some <coughs> principles of deep learning and um, let's get started on that. So the, there are two sections, two slide decks, which are fully, which are already recorded in slightly different versions and put, I've already given you the links to that. Um, one slide deck um, describes the components, the other slide deck describes the actual networks like convolutional or fully connected. Um, so this one just provides the components. So we finished the examples, then we're doing the components we use to implement these examples. And each of these components is effectively, if we go to TensorFlow or PyTorch, you just make one function call to <coughs> implement each of these components. And designing a network is joining these components together. Um, so this is just a discussion of the different things we'll, we'll, <coughs> we'll discuss here. And um, we'll start with activation. I won't, the, this here has lots of links. Um, so uh, uh, let's, let's get on to activation. All right, so here's meant to be a picture of nature's type of neurons where you have uh, axons and dendrites and cell bodies and things. And the artificial neural nets sort of model this somewhat by having a activation layer, which is effectively the response of the cell. You have the, you have the inputs from the <coughs> X0 coming in, multiplied by weight W0, the synapse, and then you the, each of these cells, <coughs> sorry, sums up the weight times the input value coming into the network plus a possible bias. That's not always true. And then you have apply a function to it, and then you just take that function. That's the output of the of the neural one. So this is all deep learning or any neural nets effectively built around this this model, and Sometimes you just use a very simple function, namely f of x equals x, namely the, you just pass on the weighted multiplication, the, the wi xi plus the bias. Um, although I have not seen a, a, a tremendously giant study of this, I think it's relatively clear that the success of deep learning is because it is not just f of x equals x. If I say f of x equals x, it would be sort of similar to other types of um, data analysis methods that produce some complex uh, parameterization of, uh, of the results. Uh, the fact that it has these nonlinear, um, these f's that can be nonlinear, produces a much more stri different structure in the results. So here I found uh, online this particular, and which with a, if you click this link here on the slides, which uh, well you effectively have, because there is a slide called components already, and it has this uh, this slide in it. Here are just some of the um, uh, the shapes of these activation functions. We have at the top f of x equals x. Um, here we have the soft plus, which is the what you use for characterization. And we have in between RELU, -E 
Um, another common one, sigmoid and tanth, we will go through, they're very common ones. You can see sigmoid and canth cut off the bottom, the, the bottom, at least negative X and positive X, whereas RELU cuts off just, neg just negative X, it makes it zero. All right. And as far as I know, there's not tremendous set of rules about what you choose for f of x and two and you typically finding the right f of x is um, one of the hyperparameters you look at. Although in some, you know, as you always, the way I pointed out that each of these components is a function call from your, in your favorite TensorFlow or PyTorch. In some types of problems like convolutional neural nets, there is an there is a folklore or consensus about the right type of um, activation layer to use. And you would normally start off with that. Now, if you go to LSTMs, they tend to always use sigmoid activation layers in, in critical cases. So you typically start with that. And I'm, when I've done these analyses, I have not seen tremendous difference between say sigmoid and tanth or other types of choices. Although some of the more extreme ones do give worse answers. <coughs> These smooth ones like sigmoid or tanth give good, or good pretty solid answers. All right, so here is, um, I've already, I don't think I even need to say this, because I've said it already on the previous pictures. Um, so this is just say, saying in words what I said in the last slide. And here is this picture of the rectified linear unit. And it has a non-trivial issue and the derivative is discontinuous. And that could, as we, as a key part of deep learning, is calculating derivatives because you want to um, find the direction of steepest descent. Discontinuous uh, derivatives can give problems. And also here you have a zero derivative because once you're in this region here, the derivative is also zero, and a zero derivative is not very useful because it gives you no information about the change. So if you are here and you want to change, say, between minus two and minus three, um, you're not gonna get any information about the derivative uh, with respect to this variable, because it's totally unchanged for large, large changes in the variable. And it's, of course, pretty easy to, to, to calculate as well. Um, So the claim is that it has, it is actually, because it doesn't um, level off as X goes to becomes large, it actually has some, that is actually a good feature. Um, I have not found RELU as better than sigmoid in the examples I've done. Uh, all right, so here is sigmoid, which is one of the most common ones. And it is just a simple mathematical function, one plus one, one over one plus e to the minus x. And so when x goes to plus infinity, it goes to one, because e to the minus x goes to zero. When x goes to minus infinity, it goes to zero, because the exponential is exponential of infinity, which it's just very large. And it goes to one or minus or zero very fast. And the derivatives are, very, are always smooth, uh, but it can be, of course, very small around here or here. Okay, so that I find uh, that's a very common activation function. Tenth, as far as I know, is essentially the same. So, yeah, it's just a simple transformation. Of the, of the sigmoid. Tenth of x is two sigma two x minus one, because tenth of x is defined here. 
And so the picture essentially looks the same, except it goes from minus one to one, which could be convenient in, in some applications, not from zero to one. By the way, this, uh, these um, activation functions are a, a significant reason why you have to be very careful about the range of your variables when you do deep learning. Because clearly deep learning cares as to whether if you took a set of numbers and you ran the um, deep learning network and then you multiply those numbers by 100, multiplying by 100 is not, if there were just straightforward multiplications without any activation, multiplying input, every input by 100 will give every output multiplied by 100. But for, because of the activation layers, this will not happen here. And uh, you do, if you multiply everything so they're very big, you're going to end up in this part or this part of the curve where nothing much is going on. So you must try to arrange for the inputs to lie in a region where there is some sensitivity. So you want your numbers to lie, say, between minus two and two. But I, and these are the numbers after you multiply them by weights and things. So you're Typically, you try to normalize your inputs to a lie between, say, 0 and 1 or some other, other restricted range of that size or smaller, <clears throat> so that when the activation functions are, are put in, they do not produce chaos. Of course, the system will learn weights that are sensible. And in principle, if you did multiply the numbers by 100, it could actually divide the first weights by 100 and get back the same answer. Uh, but it might not do that efficiently. And so it is better to start it off with roughly the right sizes for everything. So it doesn't have to um, correct by lots of uh, scaling factors. So softmax is um, you either use e to the x or e to the minus x. And it's uh, it has some you have some values, you have values here. Well, let's see, so values coming in here and the softmax essentially takes the exponential of the value and divides by the sum. So if the uh, if it was e to the minus x is done here, this will effectively um, calculate the minimum value of x. If, if it's e to the x there, then it calculates the maximum value. And of course, it's called a softmax because we could, of course, just put an activation function which actually returned the maximum. But um, <clears throat> oh, namely, either one or zero here. So if uh, if we, we we could we could define f of i of x equal to one if x of i is the largest x and zero if it's not. But this is a smoother way of doing this, and you always. Not surprisingly, they choose smooth solutions because they will differentiate and uh, give more uh, robust results. Um, so this type of softmax is used can, in also all classification problems where you want to choose something. Uh, there is a network called the transformer, which is actually mainly, a, which is nothing much to do with classifying objects, but it uses softmax to decide which particular pattern is the best fit to the uh, uh, best match to the to between in, uh, new values and old values. So softmax allows you a pretty, and this is a pretty non-trivial type of function, and it's not the type of things you see in traditional mathematics. Here is one, which actually is the one I typically use, just because it appears to be, do, um, uh, behave a little better than uh, um, something else, some of the, the, the other methods. And the claim is there's a long paper with 100 pages long or something justifying it, but it's basically a, a linear function for x greater than naught and not the totally flat x equals naught for x less than naught, but a smooth function which uh, goes to some, what does it go? Roughly goes to one minus 1.7. 
tokens between minus 1.7 and then here it actually goes to infinity. And uh, these people, I mean, for this particular peculiar, uh, the article I, I used to write these notes gave these numbers which were copied out of the original paper where they're given to incredible position. Um, and um, th these comments here come from the paper. And um, I say, I would tend to agree. I doubt that the details of these numbers, alpha and lambda are terribly important because this has basically got the important feature. It has the linear behavior, which is the REL uh, on the strength of RELU, but it has a much smoother treatment of negative values, which uh, because of the derivative issues is probably a better idea. Um, all right, so this is SCLU, but, and at least in the work I do, I, I replaced my previous RELUs by SELUs and I got the slightly better answers. Not dramatically. All right, so, <clears throat> well, I have some lectures on optimization and optimization is all about taking functions called loss functions and either minimizing or maximizing them, depending on which sign you give them. And um, this, is, this is a very, very classic idea. So I used to do this 50 years ago with Stephen when we were, and the Wolfram when we were analyzing particle physics data. But um, the loss functions uh, for deep learning have, have some features from the past in that, um, some of the loss functions are very, sim very similar to ones used in the past. Other ones are much more, sophi as more sophisticated and reflect issues of deep learning. Uh, this particular slide mentions stochastic gradient ascent. That is a way of, fine, of, of minimizing the, the um, when we have separate slides on that, that's the way to minimize the loss function. The other thing you will sometimes do with loss functions is, <coughs> I showed you last time some pictures of um, jagged landscapes, which are how the loss function looks. And often you try to regularize the function, the loss function, which just means to smooth it so that you avoid local minima and also overfitting by looking at too much of the details of a particular data set. Um, and Maximum likelihood is related to this because maximum likelihood will give you a suggested loss function because it will tend to, well, it's in the limit of the large numbers of simple uh, observations. It will tell you that the least squares loss function is the best one to use. Um, so you, you, if you go to PyTorch or TensorFlow, there's a large number of loss functions, you just choose it. You can also write your own loss function, which I do in some of my problems. Um, and um, the simplest loss function, the, the, the uh, least squares is just the difference between the prediction and the value um, squared summed over all, all uh, predictions. And this is very, this is not, not very common just because it is the traditional one because least squares is the uh, least squares formula is the sum over data points of the, uh, the observed value of the data point minus the predictive value of the data point all squared divided by the error squared. And the predictive value is what the, um, uh, the learning network gives you. I, I, it's, I know, I forget whether I say this. Um, yeah, so that's what I say here. That's, um, that's the typical mean square error. And I noticed that if I looked at the true formula for the mean square, <coughs> the squares error, <coughs> it is not this, it is this divided by the error square, where the error is the error of the observed point. And at least in some of my problems, I have arranged to uh, 
change the uh, mean square error to the appropriate um, form to put in the uh, this uh, divide by the observed the error of the observed point. And when you got on getting onto things like reinforcement learning and, and some of these other very uh, sophisticated applications, you will find sophisticated loss functions. And you need to be, and where there, the, some of the difficulty is the loss functions aren't always differentiable easily. And um, they don't even have this, I have written down uh, an important constraint, which is true in all, all the loss functions I use have this property that if you have, if you're predicting D date, D, uh, D values, the each of the losses function is the, uh, the total loss functions and some of the loss functions for each value. For one example of something we did to change this, because we were worried about very large errors, we changed this two to a four. So it's the uh, value minus the uh, prediction to the fourth power that cuts off the uh, number of uh, large deviations you get and tries to constrain the solution to not have large deviations. Um, actually, we, the, that particular paper was just published and we eventually decided that fourth power was not as good as the simplest square power because it had, it produces very, it produced some unfortunate, unreasonable um, results. But it was sort of okay, but it didn't give us, it had, that, that particular choice of the fourth power gave uh, strange, strange deviations in, in some cases. And it's always true that when you, you have all these uh, standard tools and standard answers, but any one problem, you have to look very carefully to see how to, uh, how these different choices are working out and what you should do. All right, so I consider stochastic gradients descent as a little miracle. Now, when I say steepest descent, well, steepest descent is what I used 50 years ago. When my supervisor told me, Jeffrey, nobody looks at data, look at data. When I did optimization, then I, I did sometimes use steepest descent. So there's nobody, in there. I mean, in fact, you can think of, from the history of time, people have been going, uh, going from the top of a hill to a bottom of a hill using steepest descent. So it's, it's um, not just in optimization, but in life, steepest descent is a well-known method, it's sometimes called the greedy method. You go in the direction of maximum gain for the smallest effort. And um, mathematically, it says that the, um, if you have a loss function L and you form the vector, which is, um, the partial derivative of L with respect to the uh, its parameters, that vector is the, the vector which will give the uh, steepest, will give the maximum change, uh, decrease in the loss. And it's trivial to prove that. Um, and so this, this is actually this formula here. <coughs> the parameter go, uh, that you change the parameter from its old value to the steepest, see there's a minus sign to make it decrease to a, a number times the steepest sense vector. <coughs> that is what's used in nearly essentially all these methods. Um, but although we looked at this and, uh, and used it continuously, we did not look at this brilliant idea by we, I don't just mean me, I meant the whole optimization community did not understand the concept of stochastic gradient descent. And stochastic gradient descent, maybe it's more important nowadays because of big data, it does not, here we have the sum of all data points, uh, when because that's what the loss is. 
and you you so mathematically the right formula for c percent is this where l is the sum of all data points in the stochastic variant of that you choose a sample called a batch of points in your data set and you just calculate um, the uh, derivative from those points and that's called a batch or a stochastic batch and then you keep you change eta, you tend to make it smaller, and then you run through all the data points, but divide it into batches and recalculate and, and increment the uh, parameters, which are here the, for the deep learning of the weights uh, after each batch. So you don't wait to the end. And this has lots of interesting features. It actually has you can imagine, not surprisingly, actually gives faster convergence because you're actually, as you get to the end of the the, of the batch, all the all the um, weights have been updated from the previous um, data points done before the, the the points you're now looking at, and so that gives better answers. The other um, feature is due to is due to the it has more error, there's more fluctuations attached to it. And probably those fluctuations help it to avoid local minima. Because I, uh, I think in last time I draw a picture and showed that um, local minima are when you're at a point and every direction around that point goes upwards. But it's nowhere, when, it's, it's not, not the actual global minimum. If you, if you start doing everything statistically and fluctuating around, then you're going to bounce over those small, at least the small variants of those local minima rather straightforwardly. I do not know who invented stochastic gradient descent, but it, I think it came from the deep learning community, but it's a method that's broadly applicable. It's nothing, I don't think it's much to do with deep learning. It is particularly important in deep learning because it gives much better answers and also much faster answers because um, if you if you only update at the end of each um, when you've done the whole data set, then it will just take longer to converge. Um, <clears throat> as I say I think it might even get trapped in local minima more easily. And the the language of this uh, theory is that um, an epoch is all the data data set all the data points in the data set. So that's this formula here: L equals one over d sum over the loss. And um, the batch, that epoch is divided into lots of batches, depending on how many data points there are, could be enormous number, um, hundreds to hundreds of thousands or millions. And um, you, um, you run a, the, so a typical minimization in deep learning runs over a few over a few epochs. And the number of epochs, at least in my experience, varies dramatically from application to application. Uh, and the one I'm doing now, earthquakes, it's actually converged in about 20 epochs. The one I did before on COVID infection, it is to get good answers, I had to take thousand epochs to get the most reliable answer. So, um, <clears throat> so as far as I know, there is no easy way of predicting this. And um, it's also true the number of epochs depends on this little thing called eta here, because um, if you increase eta, you might, you have two possibilities. You might diverge because you're stepping too far or you might converge faster because you're doing a bigger step in the right direction. So it is, uh, when I say I changed the number of epochs, it is possible I could have avoided that by changing uh, this uh, step size, intrinsic step size eta. All right, so this, um, so that which is called the learning rate. Um, I noted in Alex, the famous uh, image net, image net uh, Convolutional network, eta was 0.01, and then it was later divided uh, um, by 10 to as you as the uh, as you got further into the problem. Um, 
there are all sorts of subtle changes of this uh, formula here. We have, we're basically doing parameters to be determined, go to the old values plus the shift. And here we have the, the simplest uh, um, optimization method. Um, but the momentum is that the uh, idea is that, well, if, you are, if you're into a good thing, then maybe you should exploit it. So instead of doing the shift equal to a solid, the new value, you do the, um, you do a multiple of the old value, the old value for the um, shift minus the new value. And that momentum can be quite big, so 0.9. So it's dominantly not changing its direction. And obviously that, uh, again, as far as I know, this is one of these so-called hyperparameters, the momentum name. It's something you need to um, experiment with and see what works. Um, I must admit, when I find my problem is converging, I don't change the momentum or the learning rate. And, um, but there's certainly something to be looked at. I, I, when I look at hyperparameters, I don't view momentum and learning rate as my most likely parameters because they are only gonna change how much computer time I use. And maybe it's not gonna be such a big deal, whereas, some of the other hyperparameters, such as the actual network parameters, are, could have much more significant effects. Um, well, here is yet another um, another change, which is um, modifying the the shift to actually also. Um, make the weight change from proportional to its old value. And um, there are also these famous methods uh, which, are, which you invoke, Adagrad, RMS, and Adam. And uh, they all are variants of this steepest ascent, which um, are modified in various ways to try to fix the fact the steepest ascent is pretty naive. And um, in many cases where the, uh, you have a very heterogeneous system with parameters of different, different uh, sizes and different convergent rates, it is better to modify that. So again, Adagrad and Adam are ones that I often use and I, I do look in hyperparameter choices between these. And um, you need to read the original papers to understand these particular choices. But that here, this one here, Adagrad, is effectively changing the learning rate depending on the sizes of the steps. And I pointed out how important the normalization of these, uh, func these variables are. And, um, and then since you actually, you know, eta is a pretty unreasonable number because eta is just independent. Of the, I mean, it's just typically given, I mean, when you start your PyTorch or TensorFlow, we'll start with a fixed eta. And that eta is not, it doesn't bear any, it doesn't um, reflect any features of the problem. So that's actually why in the past, before deep learning, a steepest ascent was not used very much. <coughs> Rather use methods that effectively estimate the data using quadratic approximations. But the quadratic methods, which is actually what I tended to use in most of my problems, don't work for deep learning because you have too many parameters. Those matrix, you know, you can have millions of, um, or maybe billions of uh, weight, weight values to determine. And so you can't look at quadratic methods which are intrinsically proportional to the square of the number of weights. Uh, even though you can actually calculate them, it just takes too long. So especially if you're using stochastic gradient descent, so you need to calculate them very often. So they tend to use, instead of um, quadratic estimates, which actually determine eta rigorously for you, 
they use these uh, heuristic methods, which estimate um, some value for eta, which is uh, reflects some um, step sizes that we've seen, which presumably are successful because we're pursuing downwards and we would have not, we're looking, the, the solutions we're getting are ones where the loss has gone down. And so that means that whatever we did last time probably was uh, had some good features in it and we should try to learn from it for the next step. All right, so back propagation. Some people think back propagation is some deep thing. As far as I know, back propagation is the chain rule for differentiating functions of a function. And if we take our typical learning network, which here has these five layers, which remember could be 200 layers, you can see it's really a, it's just a function of a function of a function of a function is the, the, the definition. So backpropagation is just a, the correct mathematical way to calculate the derivative of the prediction, which comes out here. You want to calculate the derivative of the prediction because that's what we're going to use to do the um, steepest descent because the prediction uh, appears in the loss function. And then when we differentiate the loss function, we'll, have, we'll just clearly just have the derivative of the prediction in it. The derivative of the prediction is just calculated from this chain rule and um, propagated from the output back to the input. And you know, this is what one does as a child in calculus. Uh, this is particularly difficult to do for complex networks to do by hand, but computers have little, don't have so much trouble uh, coping with complexity of this type. And so to, as far as I know, to writing down back propagation is, it's important to do it well because it actually takes most of the, a lot of significant fraction of the compute time is back propagation. If you look at the time taken to calculate a neural net, the time calculated doing back propagation is significantly longer than the time taken doing calculation. Um, so here is this function of a function of a function, and uh, we just um, start, uh, the, so we do that recursively, applying this chain rule at each of these uh, brackets, parentheses, and um, starting here, and then we um, get an answer. All right, so and as far as I know, you don't have to worry about backpropagation. This is built in to <clears throat> TensorFlow and PyTorch or, or any of the other systems because computers know how to do this. Your job is to try to ensure that the derivatives are reasonable. So there are these clever methods, which we may probably are out some scope for this course to try to make derivatives have um, to be more reliable by changing the network, but you can't change back propagation as far as I know. That is just the mathematically only, is the way of finding the derivative and somehow you sort of have to calculate the derivative. Um, I remember when neural nets were first um, invented or looked at in detail around whenever it was, 1980s. Um, these, the fact that you would use binary representations was highly popular. And so then that's uh, shown here where we have four categories. We don't represent them as the numbers one, two, three, four, or zero, one, two, three. We represent them as the four, as um, binary values. So we have a, a, a four vector whose dimensions are horse, cat, bus, and frog. And a horse is just a one in the horse dim dimension and zero in the cat, bus, and frog dimension and so on. So that's called a one hot vector. And 
they are quite successful. And I think you know, the early work, which I used to work on with John Hopfield at Caltech, he's a very famous, much another very famous person I worked with at Caltech. And um, he had a lot, he and also somebody called Tank first did these types of binary representations and showed that they were very effective. But they get used uh, automatically in these uh, deep learning networks. All right, so this is, I'm not personally, it's, uh, I mean, I understand why a vanishing gradient serious, because um, when you have, if you, if, the, if you, if you're not careful, somehow when you do your back propagation, things at the end get lost because they get uh, multiplied by zero in the middle. And, um, there are various known strategies for doing this. The actual problems I've looked at have not seemed to have this problem, because I'm not doing totally giant 200 level concurrent neural nets. And um, the residual ResNet, which is uses residual network, is a very famous, um, for maybe the first one that used residual network systematically for images. And they had special connections to allow the things at the end to get propagated to the beginning in a in a efficient fashion, which avoids these vanishing derivatives. And the deep layers are actually probed. By deep layers, the, when we write down our set of layers, they're the ones towards the end, um, near the prediction. And um, we also commented that our ELUs were partly used to avoid the sigmoid, which has very small derivatives when the argument is greater than two or less than minus two. And so, and then we have SELUs, which are even better than RELUs because they have the positive feature that they're completely clean for positive X. And they have the desired uh, gating function of, of cutting off low X and negative X, but they do it in a fashion which preserves the derivative better than RELUs. So, so this is, I doubt if you'll come across this issue here in your in anything you do, but it's uh, obviously there's lots of discussions of this. All right, so actually originally a few years ago, I didn't quite realize hyperparameters are so important. And I didn't realize that if you look at how Google spends um, its money on computers, most of the time Google spends on computers are actually on hyperparameters. Namely, when you have your network, it has all these parameters in which are listed here, batch size, hidden layers, learning rate, decox, momentum, regularization method, trees, branches and trees, number of clusters, whatever they are. And, <clears throat> There's also the sizes, I should have put the sizes of the hidden layers, they're even the, obviously also act, choice of activation layer. So there are many, many choices you make. All of them preserve the general structure of your um, uh, neural net, but they clearly make a significant change in its numerical um, predictions. And there is a very active area of um, machine learning slash computer science, which is how to best find hyperparameters. And there are various optimized, and this again, it's actually an optimization problem, but it's a pretty different optimization problem from um, deep learning. Deep learning is effectively a continuous optimization problem typically, because all these, you're doing lots of multiplications of matrices and things like that. But, um, Hyperparameters are discrete choices of the batch size 64 or 128. We're not trying to find an optimal batch size as, an, as a number 96.234 because that's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to look at significant changes in batch size which might make a difference. Because the trade-off in batch size is non-trivial. If you change the batch size, you're gonna change the mathematics and that can change the convergence rate also, 
as you change the batch size, as you increase the batch size, your performance will get better because <clears throat> all these systems are running on GPUs and GPUs love vectors. And you can always vectorize over batch size because it always does the same thing for every member of the batch. So the best vectorization there is, is vectorization over batch members. So I had some examples on, um, I think it was the COVID, no, yeah, uh, no, earthquake, on the earthquake. I changed the batch size and I was quite surprised that when I changed the batch size, the execution time per batch was more or less unchanged as the batch went from 300 to 2400. That's because of the vectorization issue that it was on 2400, it was really vectorizing well, and on 300, not as well. So it was interesting, the 300 batch size um, gave better convergence because it was updating the, the weights more often, but it um, actually was less efficient because it took, it took much longer time to do the updates. So anyway, these are just saying, these are not easy to predict. There is an algorithm called a genetic algorithm, which is particularly well designed for um, discrete choices. That's not surprising. Genetic algorithms model what nature does with the genome. And we, uh, the genome is always there to make specific choices and how, how it builds, builds um, the organisms that it's controlling. And so genetic algorithms with, uh, which are designed around how some simple model of how nature does that and um, they were invented by a fellow called Holland in the, quite a long time ago, about, you know, 50 probably years ago or more, I don't know, it's an exact time. Anyway, they are particularly good at, at um, choosing, uh, optimizing discrete valued variables. Whereas most machine learning is aimed at continuous valued variables. So anyway, I've told you when, when Google does a deep learning uh, determination or not just Google, Facebook, what um, Amazon, Microsoft, whoever, all the big people, they will often run lots of hyperparameter choices for a given model. And so if you take the compute time you run, you need to run your model, you might multiply it by hundred to get a suitable hyperparameter choice. So hyperparameters are very important. All right, so that's the end of these components. And I say, you're going to, when you design your neural net, you put these components together. Do, do you have any questions on that? So I have a question. Um, how do you decide the number of hidden layers you want in your neural net? That's that choice is a hyperparameter choice. You, you, you like in these um, uh, <clears throat> these um, a lot of the problems I'm doing at the moment are, are time series. <clears throat> and those are done. Uh, this one approach involves um, these uh, uh, recurrent neural nets called LSTMs. Now, if you look at the literature, you can see choices one, two, or three layers of the LSTMs. And um, I actually think some, many of the papers have the wrong choice. They tend to, at least all the earlier papers, just made one layer. In all the cases I did, um, two layers always significantly outperform one layer. So I would say what I would do for that type of problem, given my experience, is I start with two layers. If I think that looks okay, I might then do a hyperparameter choice. I doubt that I'd go to one, but I might go to three layers because I'm trying to get the best answer. Best answer. And if it was a case, I guess, where the compute time was really critical, I could try one layer. But I don't think there's any objective criterion as to the number of layers. Because remember, the, the neural net is trying to represent the data. If you double the number of layers, you double the number of parameters, and you give it a better chance of representing the data. 
Now, you don't want to keep on adding parameters which have no value, because then that sort of will lead to this so-called overfitting, because it will use the extra parameters to fit unnecessary details of the, uh, of the, um, uh, of the uh, problem. But um, as far as I know, for most of these hyperparameters, whether it be the size of the layer or the number of layers is unknown. You, like, I mean, let's take an example of um, COVID. Again, the type of parameter which I spent more time on was probably the size of the hidden layer, not the number. I fixed on two, two layers quite quickly because it gave better answers than one, and I don't think three was much different. But whether you should choose, because you're feeding into that just two, two data streams. Um, and um, it's not so obvious how, how many, how many uh, what the size of each layer should be. And I probably, I think I ended up with either 32 or 64, probably 32 is the size of the hidden layer, which I did again by hyperparameter choice. I ran lots of, I have a, Google's, a Google sheet for the, for the values for the loss function, final loss function for the different choices. And I, I, I chose, and you sort of go to the place where the diminishing returns, either it gets worse if you make it bigger because it's somehow uh, doing silly things or it just levels off. I don't think there is a theory of use which is useful. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, remember, all that deep learning network is a, is a is a it's a complex mathematical formula which has got a lot of parameters into it. And what your deep learning network is is taking that complex function and fitting it to the data. And as I say, exactly what I did fifty years ago, except when I did it fifty years ago, I did not use the same complex function. I used the most simpler function, typically one coming from physics that I because I was fitting physics observations. And the model did not it was not it was not a generic mathematical model like deep learning. It was a physics model, which built in some understanding that I thought the physics had. And when I was working you know, with Nobel with Feynman as a Nobel Prize winner, he was particularly useful because he had very good physics intuition. And physics intuition tells you <laughs> what the right type of model is and what the parameters are important and things like that. So, you know, you can either bet Feynman with his intuition or the deep learning with its uh, sort of colossal capabilities and you can see which does better. Probably deep learning will do better these days on most things because the because uh, it's, it's just getting applied to things. In those days, we were fitting fitting physics observations where we had some idea what was going on. We didn't know we didn't know the details of the physics, but we knew enough to know what was important and what what should be in a model. Nowadays, when I'm fitting COVID data, say I have no idea what's I, I don't really know what's important and how to put them into the formula what the relationship of the percentage of senior citizens is in the in the in the in a particular city and how that should be put into the parameterization of the model. So there's a sort of difference between so this is the difference between the big data world which we're now in and the original world, which was if you like a, a physics world or a a world where we the model was developed by the user, like in image processing. The real, all the original image processing algorithms are built on a model of images and detailed mathematics of how you would apply an algorithm like a, a hub transform to, to actually find something out about the image. Nowadays, you don't do anything like that. You just take a convolutional filter and apply it and help and let the deep learning network learn it. In the previous days, you would have a filter, but the filter would be mathematically derived. And it, there would be a choice of which filter to use, but every filter will be determined. Nowadays, those parameters of that filter are just learned from the data. 
So we're in a world where A, we can do more general problems. And even for the non-general problems, we're going to use this method which learns everything because there's enough data to learn everything. And so this has really only been true for the last five to 10 years. Previous, what, what the previous world was different. We didn't have that much data. Also, we didn't realize the power of the, the deep, the data-driven model. I mean, as I taught, I think I said at the beginning, the reason why deep learning is replacing every other model, every other approach, is that it determines the model. You don't need Feynman to tell you what the model is. You can just let it be found automatically. Or in the case, we can say you don't need Newton to tell you how things evolve in time. You can just determine it from the data because the data has evolved in time. Okay, I will uh, edit the beginning of this and uh, put it online. And um, uh, I will set a homework, which uh, I think I will make it a descriptive homework to try to start looking at what type of areas you think are most interesting to you. Any last questions? By the way, I, I'm assuming this is effectively an officer. If you want any, if you ever any want to ask a question at any time, just send me email. There's sufficiently few students. I think that's better than having formal office hours. All right, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.